Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Handsome and Some podcast. Yeah, we're handsome. And? Handsome. <laughs> <laughs> That's a jingle, right? Is it? Yeah. Oh, maybe I should change the, the little theme tune that we got going. I love Does, the theme tune. Wait, our listeners out there, do you guys like our theme tune? If you do, comment below so we know. If not, we'll change it to something that's, I guess, cooler. Can it get any cooler, good sir? I think it can always get cooler. Well, anyways, welcome to this week's episode of the Handsome Handsome Podcast. Yep, my name's Walid, and I'm sitting with... And I'm Richard. Hey, what's up? How's it going? It's been a, been a wild week, man. Tell me about it. A wild week. I don't know maybe if it's because it's August and uh, it's winter in the Southern Hemisphere and it's just dry and everyone wants to murder each other like in Romeo and Juliet. Um, Shakespeare said, you know, the, the weather affects how we behave and what we think and what we feel. It's, uh, I agree. I agree. That's crazy. What did he say? I can't, uh, remember exactly and remember verbatim, but there's one line, um, specifically that speaks to the mood of Mercutio and Romeo and how the heat is affecting them and causing them, like spurring them almost towards violence. Very cool. That's I remember it's on the movie with uh, Leo DiCaprio and um, Claire Danes. Claire Danes. I am not that movie, man. I love the fact that they have guns instead of swords. and the... So much cooler. <laughs> so much cooler. It is. It yeah. is. And John Linguizamo is in that, one of my all-time favorites. He's the guy they played uh, in Moulin Rouge as well. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking mm -hmm. love him. Yeah. beautiful. Hey, you are beautiful. <laughs> I love him so much. <laughs> he was up alive with his outdoor music. <laughs> It's fucking great. <laughs> Wait, what is the one? What is the one? I always quote this to Melissa. I always do this. So I do the, blah, 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 you are beautiful thing. <laughs> but, uh, it's when he's on the balcony and he's, it, it, the kind of music cuts out and uh, he's like, he just kind of does this acapella a little bit. You would know the song. Oh my gosh. I have drawn a blank. We'll, we'll, come back to crazy. Crazy. we'll circle back to it. It'll come back to me. But it's, but it's so like, um, it's so like bittersweet, that little moment. Absolutely. I mean, I think obviously that the line is the greatest thing you'll ever learn is to be loved and to be and to love in return. Maybe that is to love and be loved in return. Because he does it in that accent, and he's like, "That's the one you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return." Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> All right, you didn't realize that this was a musical. This you didn't know. You didn't know that it's the musical episode. Just like they did in How I Met Your Mother. That's such a wild episode. I never finished that series. That is okay. Just like every other series that I've watched, when it goes on for more than eight, like more than six seasons, it uh, just gets disappointing. I feel like the writers just kind of lose steam. And, uh, you know, the movie makers or the filmmakers or the series makers or whatever, they're just like, yeah, I, it's so great to have steady income, but um, they just lose their creativity. Yeah. And ultimately, you always end up like Game of Thrones with slutty dragons. That's true. I mean, speaking speaking about slutty dragons, have you seen that Rick and Morty episode? <laughs> <That's> yeah, <terrible. laughs> ah, that's that's so freaking hot. Like, yeah. I it's one of the times I generally watch Rick and Morty with like a pretty stoic face, and I kind of mm. chuckle to myself, mm. like internally. Mm. But when that wizard started whipping that dragon, and he was and like. You slut, slut dragon. You're a slutty dragon. <laughs> I, I had to show Melissa. And Melissa, who's like the biggest critic of Rick and Morty, watched it. Her eyes teared up and she just burst out laughing. And she You're welcome. Like, she was like, who makes the show? What type of crazy people make the show? And I was like, they're genius. I 100% agree. Yeah. Also, big cojones grandes to just put out their art, put, yeah. put their art out there into the world. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's it's inspirational. Yeah. Here's the thing, right? So um, on that note, right? Because Rick says this crazy thing to Morty where he's just like, oh, remember one of the adventures that you wanted to do? Oh, remember when you wanted to get a dragon? Yeah, you get you got that Game of Thrones buzz right at the peak. Right? Mm. And if you remember, like Game of Thrones was like in the public zeitgeist. So it was like huge. And, you know, oh, they were, to use a Charlie Sheen quote, wedding. Yes, absolutely. Uh, they were just drinking tiger's blood at that point. But what is the... What is the, um, how shall I say, the consequence of not knowing when you're winning? How does it feel to be winning? And how do you even know that you're winning when you are? Or is it a case that you, you, you get so emboldened with this 
uh, with this feeling like this invincibility that ultimately you fall prey to it and becomes a double-edged sword. It becomes like Democulus's sword hangs from the scene. Oh, I know, man. I mean, I guess just from my experience when I was young, I guess I felt I was winning all the time because I was an idiot. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I often think about that in my adult life. Um, you know, when, when are we actually winning? Cause you know, I guess this speaks a lot to mental health and how kind we are to ourselves and, you know, really just the self-talk because, you know, the idea is you set the goals and if you achieve the goals, do you enjoy achieving the goals or are we then told another narrative that the journey is really where the magic is? So it's like, where do we, where do we really find the enjoyment? And that's really difficult because there's so many mixed signals coming from social media from the news, from basically just society in general. It's like, no one's really like figured it out what success looks and feels like and, you know, how you can really just deal with all of it, you know, the ups and downs. Because now everyone's saying, oh, I think the new buzzword this like at the moment is like, oh no, you know, failure is winning because you are learning things. And I'm like, okay, so we're winning all the time, right? Everyone gets a a naughty badge and uh, you get your participation award. So you're right. I mean, like, how do you, how do you experience it? Because I mean, like you've had some really cool jumps forward, especially in these last like, two months. I mean, you're creating your course. It's inspired you to write a book. Um, you've had some previous clients that have reached out to you and said, oh my gosh, I took advantage of you in the past and now I truly see your value and how that feels like a win. So what, what is your experience of it? Here's the thing. Uh, the, I say that a lot. I say here's the thing. Yeah, you do. We all have our little here's the thing phrases. I need to change it. That's let, okay. Let, let me try and do something different. Mm. <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, so here's the thing. <laughs> um, I've tried to cultivate, at least over these last two months and with your help, a good relationship with play. Yeah. A good relationship with playing. And I've equated that with winning. Because you mentioned something great there. You like when we were kids, we always felt like we were winning. Yeah. And were we really winning? Were we the ones scoring the goals? Were we the ones that were like held up above our friends, you know, sort of doing like crowd sailing? No. No. It's not it. No. Um, I think that what we set as our gold standard was whether or not we were could go out and play whether it wasn't raining or whether or not we could be with our friends or whether or not we could like jump across a sewer drain or you know and even the activity of failing in those circumstances weren't they weren't as grave as what we've set them to today well sure i mean sorry to interject there it's just like because I think looking at how society has morphed away from from just play, right? Imagination, creativity, you know, in the natural physical world. I think, you know, a lot of a lot of us today have forgotten the the journey, have forgotten the enjoyment, the celebration in play. And it's really great that you you know, you're bringing it back to that because I think a lot of the kids these days, you know, they they don't really know what it is because play was either on a device or play was watching TV and their idea of play is so different to how we believe uh, play is and how we experience play. Yeah, because I think that what it is is that as we grow up, we uh, build up this obsession, what like, I like to call the super soldier paradigm. Yes. Right. It's basically um, the people in charge say to you, look, there's one spot. You guys are going to have a free fall. And you're going to, whoever wins is going to be like the champion. It's like the battle royale in WWE mm -hmm. where everybody kind of goes at each other. And then basically you get one champion, but it's all a farce. Yeah. It's all part of the storyline. Yes. You know, go look, and it, go look at the script. Absolutely. Yeah, and, sure. and the more that we look at it, the more that we see that everything that's structured within our society is built on stories mm. where we are not the main character, like we spoke about uh, last time, mm -hmm. but at the same time, is, is that it's all been marketed to us. This uh, this paradigm, the super soldier paradigm, mm -hmm. is like the infinite game we spoke about previously, which is, is that they've built it so that you can compete with your peers as opposed to play with them. Uh, you know? Uh, and the biggest problem there is, is that you always want to score a goal against your peer, not play with them to collectively play so that you both feel like you're winning. Yeah, I guess, you know, I mean, being the youngest of three in my family, 
I pissed my brothers off so much because I just enjoyed the act of playing. Mm. I don't give a, I don't care if I won or I lost when I was a kid. It was just super cool to be playing with my older brothers because yeah. you know I was like you know the the last born and I wasn't really cool. So when they had capacity and they allowed me to play whatever games it was, whether it was like. I don't know, pool every now and then, table tennis, handball, even just throwing the ball. I just felt like that was such a win because I was enjoying the play. Yeah, Be because when you enjoy the play and think about it, right, you mentioned Shakespeare. You mentioned the idea that, you know, a lot of the times we have catharsis through going to watch plays. Yeah. The, iter the iterative word here is plays. Yeah, well, I mean, at university, like our one of our heads of department says there's a reason that it's called a play. Yeah. Is because you on stage need to play yeah. and the audience needs to enjoy the play. Yeah. Ing that is going on. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the most important thing there is is that when you focus on playing, you're learning. You're learning things about yourself. So a good okay. example is is like a lot of kids, you take on the role of the policeman, of the Nate American, the uh, you know, the cowboy. Um, you know, you take on the roles of all of these different things and you get to play the villain and the hero. You yeah. get to play all of these different capacities and then you discover elements about yourself. I mean, I've got this funny memory where I insisted on being the Native American while everybody else was trying to be cowboys. And I think it's kind of colored the rest of my life in that way is, is that I've always kind of been a, a champion of the underdog. And what's funny about that little story is, is that, you know, our brothers dressed, dressed up like cowboys because that's the popular thing. And like the mm. whole school dressed up like cowboys and I was the lone sort of Comanche Native American. Nice. And you know what the crazy thing about it was? Well, is that for the whole dress up competition, I won. Of course you did. Right. Pirate thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I dig that. No. Uh, also, listen, I watched this one reel. And in this reel, it was it's so interesting. And I want to get your take on this, Walid. Is this this doll, I cannot remember her handle, nor her name, um, right now. But I'll get back to you on that one. But she was saying, you know what the problem is? Is that everyone thinks that they're the lead in their own story. And that's a problem, right? Because if you think about a story, right? I mean, you know, you've made incredible films. Is the lead doesn't know that they're the lead. They're just on some sort of journey because they've been thrust into a situation that they didn't ask for. Right? So she says, stop trying to be the lead in your own story and be the director. Plan your life as if you are the director and you can see the whole vision of the journey in front of you. So your goal setting is really you as the director are designing how the lead character will then experience the journey. Isn't that wonderful? What are your thoughts on that? I love that because... Uh, my barber, uh, his name's Daniel. He's based out in Rosebank. Shout, shout out to him. Daniel. Yeah, he runs a barbershop called Celebrity Barbershop in, uh, in Rosebank. Fantastic. And I love it. We always have great conversations. Yeah. Because um, that's what barbershops should be, right? It's like, it's like barmans of old. Well, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, uh, I guess it's the male version of a salon. <laughs> you know, you go there to, you go there to, to figure out what's happening on the ground. Because, you know, there's chatter and, you know. Bob is they meet such wild and interesting people because, you know, everyone needs a haircut and a shave and, a, you know, look dapper. Absolutely. And I mean, this is why they call it intellectual salons, right? Philosophers used to call when you, you have a collection of philosophers, they used to call it salons. No. Yeah. When you basically Didn't just come that. together and, and, and basically chew the fat. Look at that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, amongst uh, great little things that he said, um, he sent me this thing last week where he said that Possible and impossible are just constructs, constructs of the mind. Interesting. Right. And he says that you, you can go beyond those mm. because they don't necessarily exist. Interesting. Right? So when you talk about direction, that's often what directors do, right? Mm. It's because when a director gets a script, right, or when mm. they write a script, if they're a writer-director, oftentimes they can, you know, sort of elevate themselves up above this, uh, uh, the script and see it holistically. They can read the ending before the beginning, Correct. read the middle. They can jump in and out of time because they're not trapped by it. Correct, yeah. Often the performers, to your point, are trapped within the, the sort of a linear structure of the story. Mm, yeah. Right, even within scenes. And that's where people get this problem with, right, where they're mm. trying to compete with one another. You've seen it on movie sets, where, for instance, you're trying to do a scene with an actor 
and they're insistent on competing with you as opposed yeah. to you collectively winning a scene to get yes sure right. sure, sure, sure sure because the objective should be singular along with the director and oftentimes this is one of my little sort of lambaste was that how you say that word lambing sir or whatever you want to call it or, or rant against uh, South African director writers yes because oftentimes within the South Africa director writer space oftentimes they are ex actors ah uh, right okay and I've always I've always noticed that a lot of directors who are ex actors compete with the actors that they are directing it's tiring man it is and I always find it confusing because I'm like no one's going to see you. Well, I mean, if you're a good, if you're a great director and a great writer, the audience will see you. They'll see you in the flavor that you bring to the film. But no, they won't. They won't physically see your face. But you you mentioned something really great there, flavor, right? It's like when you go to a restaurant and you eat food, right? And you're like, wow, this is so great. Can I see the chef, please? Right? But before you even request to see the chef, the experience is in the food. It's in the mm, ingredients. Yeah. Now imagine if the chef was like, you know what? You know, the, you know what the steak needs? It needs some salt. Like Leon Schuster. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And he, he rubs it underneath his armpits. That's smacks. Ah, anyway, took my tongue, baby. There we go. Now imagine he did that and he sent it out. Yeah. It, it's like, I don't want to taste you. I want to taste what you can do. And, sure. and the thing is, is that a lot of the times I see a lot of actor directors compete with their actors. When in actual fact, they should be in service to the actors. So to mm. your point around what this um, this broad was saying, sound very 1950s. Mm, yeah. Ah, tell you, tell you what, see? Tell you what, say, broad. <laughs> this broad. Hey. Um, so what she's saying is, is that look at it holistically and then act accordingly. I think it was genius. Because also, like, I found another reel that she kind of extrapolated on that idea. <laughs> and she, she really basically just shows her computer screen and she says, this is how I set up the systems that support the narrative that I'm trying to create. And I'm like, you are messing with me and this is genius. I loved it so much. And, you know, starting to think about it that way, it's basically saying what manifestation is, right? You see it before it happens. Yeah. Um, that's goal setting, right? You set the goal before you really know how it's going to come to fruition. This is how entrepreneurs think. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? It's, they're the directors of the business. That's it. And that's why they call them MDs, like managing directors, right? Yeah. And that's why we have so many directors in different places all across the world. So that's the thing is I think I think the lesson that I learned from this one is if you're really looking to change your life, start thinking about it from a holistic director point of view. So take a high level overview and, you know, maybe take a step back, you know, launch that that jetpack that you have on your back and take a high level overview of your forest, of your problems, of your this and that, and see where you can move a couple of things and where you can use your creativity to create the life that you really want to live. And then create the systems that will supplement and will support that that goal. Now, there are some people out there who are sitting there going, that's all good and well, but damn it, I'm in the middle. I'm in the thick of it. I don't have the luxury of doing that. Yeah. What do you say to them? Uh, you know what? I've been there too. I've been there a couple of times. And I think that's the only reason that I can speak to that point is if you find yourself stuck there, if you find yourself in the middle of the story and it just feels like you're getting hit from left, from right, from up, from down, I think the best thing that you can possibly do is change change the flow. What I mean by change the flow is go is go and do something that is sort of out of, out of the, the norm right now. Because right now you're probably not having a lot of fun, right? So go change that. Go find something that sets your soul alight. Go speak to people that, you know, really add true value to your life. People that are different, have experiences that are different, that will help you get that perspective. Because, you know, even if we're talking story, even in the world of the movie, right? So we're getting shown a small portion of the lead's um, story, of the lead's life. But that can't be the the only thing that they're doing. So this is also where, you know, speaking about Free Guy, geez, man, oh, we love Ryan Reynolds. Anyways, back to Free Guy. Um, Free Guy's so crazy because he plays the character of an NPC, a non-player character, and it's really about his experience as not the lead character, and how him as the NPC, he's the lead in his own character, in his own story, 
and he's finding things that that change his world that you know and we're discovering that as the audience members and we need to understand that you can also take an npc day and go and explore something that's completely different that is not on the narrative that you've been that that's been thrust upon you or that you believe that you have to like live today you can go do something else um so what so what you're saying is is that um if you find yourself in a position whereby you you can't kind of use that jetpack in order to see the sort of forest from the trees, what you should do is recognize that your story is not finished yet and that you require some sort of oasis, some yes. sort of reprieve, some, yeah. something where you can go and play. Something that's, that removes the blinkers that you have from the race that you are running so that you're right, so that you can find the play. You can find the world that you're playing in and go discover something new about it. I think it'll give you a brand new perspective. You know, there's a quote by Hideo Kojima, which is like one of my sort of hit bros. Um, and he says, you know, a film can save your life. It's one of the reasons why I became a film maker. It's because generally when I'm down in the dumps or where I'm like against the wire or like I'm putting the pressure on myself or I feel the pressure, I know I need to have that little uplet. I need to have that little, um, how shall I say, that little oasis. And oftentimes that's like going to a cinema for me. Sure. It's, or, you know, it's all like going on a holiday. It's about doing something perhaps that's not, um, that's not got to, that's not concerned with the work of it. Sure. And to find the play of it. I mean, mm. I've spoken about this story a lot of the times, but the only time that I really got down to editing verified after like seven months of failing and trying to put like 10 minutes of it on a timeline and mm. like doing 12 versions of it before I could begin because I was obsessing about getting it perfect mm -hmm. was when you and I had a chat and, you know, you had demystified Dylan for me to, to quite a degree. And then I realized, oh, wait, hold on a sec. Yeah. I love this. Yeah. Like, this is one of my passions. This is what I wanted to do my entire life was make a film. And then I slapped Laws and Dance on the timeline. Love that song. And literally, yeah, edited the whole sort of opening to that song. Oh, and yeah. literally, that opening hasn't changed now that the film's kind of been like all around the world. All I did was I just kind of took a Laws and Dance out because Stromae wouldn't give me the license to show. Sure. Well, sometimes I, oftentimes I think, you know, we overcomplicate things. How do you play cricket? What do you need to play cricket? A violin. Uh, yeah. All right. I can tell that you're a sportsman. Um, so here's the thing. So what do you need to play cricket? You need a ball, yeah. right? You need a bat and you need something Jack, that's wicked. that feels like wickets, right? In this discussion, did I say that you needed a kookaburra bat? Otherwise you can't play cricket. And you need a slazenger ball because otherwise you can't play cricket. And you need specific wick. No, I didn't. This is also the thing, right? So let's. This is this is the part of the show that we reveal some of the magic, some of the secrets, in order to start us communicating with you. Because everyone that's listening to this is more important than you know than the grant than making a podcast. You're more important than creating content. You, you the, you're the important part of this. So what Waleed and I have done is, uh, we, the secret's out, Waleed, I'm so sorry, but we're telling our audience members that we record this podcast every Sunday on a cell phone. Yes, we do. Yeah, we don't have a crazy studio. We don't have fancy yep. man's mics. We literally record it onto my cell phone. Absolutely. Isn't that wild? So the idea is that, you know, we're waiting for permission. And sometimes permission sounds like a kookaburra bat. Sometimes permission looks like a proper... Um, podcast studio, and it's not. You don't need those things to get started on the things that you want to start on. So sometimes you need to go find the play and say, hi, hey, you know what? How can we do this? How can we play cricket? How can we play whatever the game it is that you that you want to play in, right? You, director, how can I play the part of a director? What do you need to direct a, a movie, right? You need some words written down, which is called a script, mm -hmm. some sort of story, some sort of idea. You need a camera. No one said which camera. No one you said. need someone, you know, to record some sound, right? Because we're in the talkie era. We're not in the black and white silent films. But you could yeah. make a silent film. Of course, you could. Yeah. Uh, you need some sort of actors and you need to be able to cut it all together. That's what making a movie is. I mean, we, I know we spoke about this before, but it takes me back to Daryl Ruitt. Mm. 
He said, how do you make a movie? He says, you get actors, you put them in front of a camera, and you record something. And you do that enough times until you can cut it all together and it makes up a movie. And you rinse and repeat that until you've got movie after movie after movie. And every time you do it, you will get an increment better than you were the last time. That's the play. And I think what it speaks to is this. You know, you've touched on a couple of different points there, and I love it because at the end of the day, it's about how flexible of an instrument are you. And it, that's, it's how are you played. If you think about yourself as a musical instrument, as the instrument to make film, as the instrument to write, as the instrument to do all I hear you, but yeah. just according to our analogy today, instead yeah. of that you're the instrument, because that sounds like you're the lead character, <laughs> what about the musician playing the instrument? I want to get to that. the musician, you know what I mean? Because then you can make sweet, sweet music on that saxophone. That's your tools. That's who you are. That's your journey, right? Is you're the sweet saxophone singing there at 12 o'clock at night while you're giving googie eyes to the person that you fucking dig, you know? But you're the actual, you're the musician. You get to decide which piece of music you want to play. You get to decide if it's a Phil Collins evening or if it's a Seal evening or if it's just a good old classic Kenny G. You bring up a good point there. Because what about Thank resistance? You. Because when you give anybody any type of agency, like you've just done, you encounter resistance. Of course so, you do. So we talked about winning and knowing when you're winning and essentially also going on the journey towards winning. But most people stop because they feel a sense of resistance because you've just given them a choice and choice often represents resistance. It's like, if you choose to do this, I might win. Huh. You, you said it beautifully. It's like, it's like when we started Verified, we sat at this very table that we're sitting at right now and you said to me, what will you become when you get everything that you've ever wanted? And that's a terrifying thought for most people, including myself. Yes. Yeah. Uh, me too. Exactly. So that, that sense of agency of like, what if I win? What if I succeed at all of my dreams? Mm. Who will I become? Mm. Will I become like the villain version of myself? Mm. Right? Is that wild? Yeah. And it's like, if I become that sexy saxophonist, that's kind of giving googly eyes to the person that I love, what if I give it to like everybody? Like, what if I give it to her and the next night I give it to somebody else and I give it to somebody else and I'm I mean, this philanderer. I guess you're right. What if all of those opportunities it, like erupt something dark within me? And I think that's what a lot of people also, or what if it erupts something light within me, you know, and yeah. th that's, Either one of those is a choice outside of comfort. So I'll give you a good you example. I was about to say, I could give you a good example. Go for it. We spoke about it last week, right? Batman versus Superman. Mm -hmm. Who's the bad one in that one? So what if you become Batman? You can't make a different choice? You know what I mean? Even once Batman realizes he's a dick in that movie and, you know, Superman is, is not, not with us anymore, he makes a different choice. And he's like, I can be better. Even the dickhead can be better. So... <laughs> You know, this is also the thing is like, you can, you, the choice, you know, left or right, you can still make another choice somewhere down the line to go left or right. Yeah. So this is also the thing, tying you back to the musician idea, tying you back to the director idea. Mm -hmm. You can take a high level overview and say, wow, what do I want to do with this power? Because Uncle Ben said it best. Mm. You just said, go with my me. reference. Go for it. Go with me with great power comes great, great responsibility. responsibility and this is really what this podcast is about because you gents sitting there listening to this you have innate power and it's how you choose to use that power which really determines where your hero's journey goes or what your story looks like a lot of people use the term legacy, right? That's when we look back on the story that we created, when we're now close to the end of our story. But you can be creating the legacy today. You can make the choice today. Even if you are swamped, you can say no, right? You can make a, a different choice because you are powerful. Here's the thing. Yeah. You, you mentioned. I'm going to make, I'm going to release, we're going to start releasing t-shirts. If anyone out there that's listening to this wants a, Here's the thing, t-shirt from the Handsome Handsome podcast. Uh, just give us a thumbs up and uh, share this with your mate that you might think would like a here's the thing t-shirt. I've got a better one. What if we say here's the handsome thing? I mean, we could do that, but here's the thing. And then just with a cheesy picture of your face, it'll be fantastic. <laughs> but here's the thing. Um, I'm, I've recently started re-watching the same Sam Raimi 
Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. Yeah. Uh, Melissa was feeling down one day and she was like... Arguably the best Spider-Man, but, uh, you know, I mean, he's my Spider-Man. He's my Spider-Man too. Um, so Melissa was feeling down one day and I was like, what'll be a quick pick-me-up? And right on Netflix was, you know, the first Spider-Man. Like, let's just put that on. And now we're like two films down and we've just started the third one. And this is what made me ask that question because you mm. brought up saxophone and immediately I started mm. to speak, think about, you know, dark Tobey Maguire. Mm. You know, when he's, when he's like, I'm about to put some dirt in your eye. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? Sorry, this is left field, but yes. dark Tobey Maguire, dark Spider-Man, you know, uh, angstified. Yeah. He should give you all the confidence and encouragement in the world. Yeah. And here's why. Because, sorry, Toby, I'm a huge fan of yours, but no one can ugly cry like Toby Maguire. So no matter what is going on in your life, <laughs> you will probably look better than Toby Maguire crying in that third Spider-Man film. My goodness. she who we he Oh, man. Here's the thing. Again. <laughs> All that. I'm team. Stop thinking about it. It's part of you. It's your DNA. Oh, my goodness. Speaking about DNA. So that black suit Spider-Man, right? The yes. black suit, Venom, basically. Yes. Is yes. There's the symbiote, right? Um, to make the sort of line of uh, connection is, is that that's the instrument of Spider-Man's uh, id coming to the fore. Yes. Right? That's, that's the fear that Peter Parker has. Mm. What will what'll I become once I can do whatever I want? Yeah. Right? In the second Spider-Man, he's trying to choose... Challenge between, you to go do it. Yeah, go it out. He's trying to choose between what you brought up, which is great power, great responsibility. Mm. Do I choose Mary Jane mm. or do I choose to be Spider-Man? And at the end of that film, he gets both. Right? Yeah. Beginning of the third film is interesting, right? Because he's winning in the beginning of that third film. Sure. Right? The city loves him. He's with the girl of his dreams. All of those things are happening. And then what does he do? He kisses Gwen Stacy. Idiot. Exactly. Right? But good for him. What? At the same time. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. That's devil's advocate. Don't be yeah. a dick. I, I literally still watch that scene, like the kid in that scene, who is like, no, Spider-Man, no, don't do it. Don't do it. There's no hope. Yeah, listen, I get it. But yeah. also, speaking about that resistance, you spoke about resistance yes. before. Let's get back to my saxophone, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't push any buttons and you don't have that little mouthpiece in the saxophone, what's going to happen? This is this is the point that I'm trying to make. Is uh, that carry on, sir? Sorry. If, if you think of yourself as the instrument, right? Yes. There's a Bruce Lee quote which I love, mm -hmm. right? And it goes something like this: It says, "When I expand, my opponent contracts. When he contracts, I expand. I do not hit. It hits all by itself." Do you get that? Right. I mean, I hear that, but I don't think it's it's processing. So, so basically, what he's trying to say is is that if you practice, which mm. is a synonym for play, mm. if you think about it, mm -hmm. you play all the time. You make sure that your instrument is flexible. You make sure it's in tune. You make sure all of these things are happening. You take care of yourself in that way. When you're called upon, you don't have to think about the agency of doing it or not doing it. It'll do it all by itself. And the point that I'm trying to make there is like what you said, and a, a great mentor of mine, Cliff Shane, he taught me this, right? He said, um, Federer is just as good with a shitty racket as he is with a, with like a Slazenger racket. Yeah, because he's playing tennis. Because it's him. Yeah. He's playing tennis. The 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 tennis racket doesn't matter. Mm. He could beat you with anything. The same way that mm. Scorsese could shoot a, a film on an iPhone or on an Ari. Mm -hmm. It'll just still be a Scorsese Correct. Film. He's making a film. Exactly. Because... It's about honing himself or honing herself, mm. which ultimately defines whether or not you are a whole perfect, not a perfect person, because mm -hmm. the point is not to be perfect. It's mm -hmm. just to be complete. Yeah. Sure. To seek out experiences and make you complete. Because in that same Rick and Morty episode, if I'm not mistaken, you know, he does the save game episode. He does the save game um, uh, device. We Morty. don't think that's it. Yes, it is the same episode. Right? Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, we're yeah, berating yeah. him about the dragon. Oh my gosh. And then Morty goes off and lives this whole life with that girl. Oh gosh. Yeah. And it's like beautiful, like society of snow thing that happens. Mm -hmm. And then he's airplane. He's, yeah. and the no almost death. And then idiot pushes the button and he's back to square one. That's it. And what is worse? I don't it's know. Square one, right? I don't know. I th do you know what I think? What's worse is how many Mortys he killed in pursuit of his saved game. 
Look, I think that that's the cynicism of the writers <laughs> coming through where they kind of just have to pull the rug from underneath yeah. you. But I found that whole little sequence so beautiful where he falls in love and he goes through these trials and then he learns that he doesn't have to reset it back to some sort of point. Because to that person that we spoke about who can't use the jetpack mm. to see the forest from the trees, mm -hmm. that's what they feel like. They're in the snow. They're sure. in that moment. Sure, sure, sure. And that consequence, that is the experience of life. That is you being played. That is, that is your instrument being hollowed out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a great poem that talks about this, is, is that the pain of a flute being carved out allows the music to flow through. Yeah. You know, so the holes that you dig out of it yeah. allows it to make this melody. And for me, that's always the way that I try and see it. So when you spoke about like in these last two months, mm -hmm. I've gotten back to that philosophy, which is, is that I don't obsess about winning. Mm -hmm. I obsess about playing. That's because cool. Because it's 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 more jazz than it is rap battle. Well, I mean, like, listen, yeah. you know, the way that you've just expressed it now, it's, you know, it, in business, they speak about the the six systems of business, mm -hmm. right? The value the, the, at the top of the at the top of the list is your leadership system, right? This is how you think, how you feel, how you deal with high pressure situations, how you react, right? This is really just about your head, your heart, your health, right? Your leadership system. And the one below that is your value creation system, right? Is what are you what are you creating? Is it a product? Is it a service? Um, or what are you what are you giving back, right? What what do you what do you have to offer, right? Without the leadership system, you'll never create anything of value because if your leadership system is fucked and you're not feeling particularly good about yourself, you're never going to think of hey, what can I create that's of value that other people will get be will have you know get benefit from, right? And after the value creation system, we talk about the marketing system, the sales system, the operation system, and then finally at the bottom is is the is the financial system, right? Because in every business, finance money needs to come in and money needs to go out, right? It's the it's the exchange. But what are we saying when it comes to the value? Is that's where you really discover your value. But isn't it strange that our society and the people who are playing the infinite game and sort of puppeteering our strings mm. only associate your value or any type of value on monetary gain? So for instance... Well, yeah, but that's, I mean, we spoke about this last week about the industrialism and, you know, the industrial age and why society is like that. But obviously the more informed you are, the better choices you can make. And yes, it's hard because we've been conditioned to, to you know, to do a certain thing. That's like someone saying to you, hey, man, I see you've been running your entire life, but if you lift your knees a little bit higher, you could run faster than Usain Bolt. And you're like, no, no, I won't do that. Because obviously you're not running the 100 meter sprint mm -hmm. and you don't want to do that. And it's also difficult to change that habitual behavior. We all have habitual behavior in a wide variety of things. We have habitual behavior with how we think, with how we speak, with who we speak to with who we associate ourselves with, with, you know, the type of value we create, with the type of value that we believe we are with our belief systems. There's, there's so many habitual behaviors and changing any single one of them is uncomfortable. It's that fear that we were talking about, right? It's that fear of the unknown. What if I become everything that I always wanted to be? Or what if I take a shot and I become everything I don't want to be? But here's the thing, right? Remember we were talking about play today's today's whole talk is about play. What if you are the cop? And what if you're the robber? You're still playing, aren't you? Yeah. So so let's get it back to the original question. Where's the success in that? How do you know that you're successful? Well, here's the thing. Again. <laughs> I've met so many different creatives that are criminal or were criminal. Mm. Their stories begin in a criminal sort of type of space mm -hmm. and they migrate to a creative space. I mean, look at Ro Robert Downey Jr. What I was Yeah, he kind of lost his way a little bit there. Well, the, the creative mind is quite criminal. It's, uh, it's, it's, it, it courts anarchy. It doesn't like authority. It doesn't like the rules naturally. Sure. So when you're choosing the cop or the robber, the creative mind will go, well, the robber, because like F the police, right? Sure. And a lot of the times what you have to find is, is that your proclivity towards the, being the thief mm. needs some sort of structure for you to not become the uh, 
the criminal mm. in that sense. Mm. So, you know, um, Werner Herzog says this better. He says yeah. it's the best. He says that for creatives and for filmmakers particularly, he says, stop thinking of yourself as a garbage collector. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of creatives think of themselves that way. Mm -hmm. simply because society undervalues them. And also they treat their discipline like garbage collection. Sure. So they overshoot or they, they overthink, you know, so they have reels and reels and reels of footage. They don't get the proper coverage. But he says, think of yourself more as a thief. You sneak in the middle of the night. Mm. You grab the jewels. Mm. You get out mm. before anybody notices. Mm -hmm. And if you think of yourself like that, that's where the thief paradigm comes into play. Yeah, right. It becomes a little bit it becomes a little bit more inclined towards your value system. You also get to be a bit of a rapscallion, which is like part of your id. You're not suppressing those things, mm -hmm. but also at the same time, you're you're living out those things healthily. You know, and the most important aspects of trying to find your way through all of this, I cannot help but be reminded of, do you know the Undisputed series, film series? Uh, yeah, sounds super familiar. Yeah, with Scott Atkins. Mm -hmm. And he has this great line, right? So the Undisputed film series was was obviously started with, uh, I believe it was Wesley Snipes and Ving Rhames, the first film. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then from the second film, uh, there you encounter Scott Atkins as Yuri Boyka, Right. Mm -hmm. And his whole claim to fame is, is that I must be the most complete fighter. Right. He plays the villain in that. It's a pretty good accent you got there. Thank you. Yes. Uh, da. Da. Yes. Uh, gotta love Scott Atkins. Uh, B movie gold. Um, and he's like, I must be the most complete fighter. And at the end of the second film, spoilers, he gets his leg broken. Right. And he's like this super kicking crazy person. Yeah. Right. And you think, oh, okay, cool. Villain. And so you get to Unspirited 3, and he's the hero of that film. And he's oh. like mopping the floors, right? Garbage mm. connector. Mopping the floors, and there's like all of these fighters that are in No, the I am the most complete cleaner. Exactly. And what's crazy about it, he uses the tools he has at his disposal. So he takes his mop, and he creates like a stint on his leg. There it is. Right, there we yes. go. And uh, he, he, he trains himself back to the most complete fight of Niels. And uh, oh. he goes up against the big bad there and he escapes. Okay. Right? Cool. And then you get to like Undisputed 4 and he goes up against like this American and he has this line, which mm. I love and I mm -hmm. still use it today. Anytime that I'm feeling like it's a slag, mm. like I hate what I'm doing, the mm. pressure's on, whatever, uh, there's a scene where he's like lifting rocks, right? So the big bad who's played by Marco Zorro yes. is like needs, needs to fight him. But what he does is he occupies him with menial work. So he, he can't train. Mm -hmm. So the, the time he has for training is limited. And it's the infinite game that the big bad is playing with him. Mm -hmm. And he says to Turbo, which is like the, his American com compatriot, while they're lifting rocks, he says, we can look at this as work or we can look at this as training. You know, and I, I say that line to myself all the time, which is perspective, all about perspective. How you approach the things that you're doing, and you spoke about this, which mm. is like our society is like, oh, winning is just failing all the time. No, training is creating a good relationship with failing. Yeah. You know, you train to failure so that you can get better. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you, man. And um, yeah, I guess that's also looking at it from that high-level director's point of view is that you get to decide what the perspective is. Um, I know that it seems overwhelming. It looks like... You know, the walls are super high around you sometimes and it feels claustrophobic, but you are both lead in your story and director telling the story. I know that's a weird one, right? So that's, it feels like, like a little bit of crazy to understand, but you are infinite because you're playing the infinite game. So you've got it. Da, think of it. Uh, you can either think of this as hard work or think of it as training. Yes. Yes. I love it. So what would you like to do? If you like to train, comment train below. If you like hard work, comment hard work below. I don't know why I'm doing this bit. Keep crying. Anyways. Um, stick with it. <laughs> stick with it. <laughs> don't abandon me, Richard. Yeah, listen, well, that's what I feel like. Um, you know, I've been trying to change, change my body for the last two months. Eesh, man, sometimes it feels like hard work. But most times I just remind myself, this is the cost. Of the goals they want to reach. Not yeah. the girls, the goals. I, I mispronounce. Both. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so yeah, if you want to be the most complete fighter. Sexy uh, fighter. Sexy, sexy fighter. 
while we while we're on this, I'm gonna wrap up with a joke real quickly. Yeah, go on. Uh, so a Russian comes home late one night, right? He uh-huh. opens up the fridge. I'm stealing this joke from a comedian. If you're out there, I apologize. But he opens up the fridge, yeah. right? And as he opens up the fridge, the jelly in the fridge starts to wobble. Mm. And he's like, calm down, jelly. I'm here for the vodka. <laughs> <laughs> on that note thank you for tuning into the handsome and some podcast i'm sitting here with my good friend richard yo what's up and i'm sitting here with my talented filmmaker friend Willied. absolutely and if you like what we have to say please like subscribe and share this with someone that you love that is in the trenches and is working hard but in actual fact you see them as training to become the turbo to your boyka Absolutely, because really listening to this podcast is just training. Duh. Duh.